Um, good morning and welcome to the Washington College of Law. I'm uh, Michael Carroll, the director of the program on information justice and intellectual property, and we're happy to welcome you all here to the second annual Cherry Blossom uh, Festival uh, in which we uh, take our area of intellectual property law and, and look at it with a broader lens. And I also particularly want to welcome the folks who are joining us via the live webcast. We have a number of people out on the West Coast for whom it is very early in the morning, uh, and so thank you for getting up early to join us. Um, our program, uh, we believe, is quite distinctive in, in the United States because our approach to the field of law um, uh, teaches the core competencies that any lawyer should need to know within the core disciplines of patent and copyright and trademark and trade secret. And each of those bodies of law have a series of technical requirements and that require careful, detailed legal analysis. And, and we, we recognize the need to train lawyers with that uh, expertise. But we would be remiss if that's all we thought our job was to do, because these fields of law interact with a wide variety of interests in society and with a wide variety of other bodies of law. And our event today is emblematic of our commitment to placing our field of interest within the broader framework. And this particular uh, Cherry Blossom Festival is an attempt to use um, our position in Washington as a way in which we can look at the, the ways in which intellectual property rights intersect with other bodies of federal law. So for example, you might the Supreme Court will hear a case about the retransmission of television programming. And there is both a federal a communications law aspect to that case, or at least in the framing of the industry, as opposed to the, just this narrow copyright question that the court will formally be addressing. Or in the pharmaceutical industries, certainly we don't limit uh, the incentive regime or the regulatory regime to considerations of patent law. Uh, the Food and Drug Administration has, plays an important role in that in that sector of the economy as well. And we could go across the other areas and show that other bodies of federal law, other agencies of the federal government, have an interest in, have a say in, in the formation of innovation policy, in, in artistic and cultural policy. Um, and that is the kind of framework in which we uh, we bring our attention. There's another way in which we try to be broader than the standard sort of approach, which is, and, and I want to direct this comment to the law students in the audience. Whenever you hear about a legal right, you need to understand that some kind of political contest preceded that, and the, the person, the interest group that obtains the right is the one who is sort of victorious in that contestation. Because you, what, in a policy framework, you think about interests. And interests then contest in the political and policy framework. And that, that contest often then ripens into the legal right uh, possessed by one of those uh, contestants. And so today, we're going to be doing a mix of, of law and policy, where we will look at some of the interests that were not recognized in the formation of intellectual property rights, that interests that um, particularly Native Americans have in, in their own culture, in their own identity, um, that are not formally recognized in, in the way that uh, our trademark system works, or, or, or in genetic resources that are particular to the group, and the group identity is not does not fit comfortably within the rights framework that the IP system has. And so today, we'll be looking at uh, interactions between the formal system and this interest group, and, and my distinguished colleague Peter Yazzie is going to explain more about that. So with that, that uh, uh, kickoff, I want to uh, next introduce my distinguished colleague Victoria Phillips, who directs our Glushko Samuelson uh, Intellectual Property Clinic, which has a special role in today's programming because in the final panel that I'll be moderating, students from that clinic will actually be part of our present Pre presenters, and Vicki, why don't you tell us more about why that is?
right there, law professor Dana was great. Um, of course, she ran into the Supreme Court um, appeal of the uh, race of the Washington football trademark challenge. Um, and so we became friendly with Suzanne, and the fit was natural because my colleague Christina had actually written in this area before, and my colleague Peter Yahoo had done a lot of work internationally on engagement rights. And it just seemed like a great fit. And then something, the lore is, and I think it's true, that and those of you who follow the trademark case know, probably know, um, were thrown out on the doctrine of latches. The, the plaintiffs had slept on their rights and had challenged the lots of time. So now the new Black Horse case for the man the Black Horse and her co-plaintiffs is moving forward in the TTAB. And it's it's interesting because Suzanne, when you think about the reason that Suzanne's case was thrown out, um, she didn't know about the possibility of challenge. I think this is right, she, she's here, so she can correct me if I'm wrong. She learned about the challenge, cancellation of a trademark, from a, a meeting with a, a lawyer in Minneapolis when she was out protesting the, the Super Bowl when the Washington team was playing in Minneapolis. And she was interviewed for an article. Um, and I think it's that author, that scholarly author, that law professor, who was writing the article that let her know that this was a, a cause of action. Have you ever considered petitioning to cancel the mark? So it strikes me as very strange in, in other areas of law and torts and stuff. You know, if the doctors left a sponge in your in your veins, you, you have this discovery rule, right? Um, and you, 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 the, the statute of limitations doesn't run until you discover the harm. And in a way, even though it was thrown out of latches, but for this law, um, academic journals, you know, conversation with Suzanne. She would not have, uh, she wouldn't have known about it. So she didn't know about it. She didn't really slip on her rights. She filed the action when she knew it was a possibility. And so that that spurred us, and that little light bulb spurred us to think that there's just, Suzanne is, and you will hear, I'll read her biography, is such an accomplished Washington cultural property expert. She knows this area. She's worked in Washington. She worked in the White House. She knows this, and she didn't know it. So we thought the clinic, the law students that I supervise, who are generally third years, um, who work as attorneys and represent clients, we thought it could be a great value add to create a little survival guide, intro to IP, know your rights for, for the native communities. Um, so hopefully people will know their rights. And so, so two of our students <coughs> in the panel will be presenting a little glimpse of this publication that we hate, hope to roll out. Um, so I, I hope that's um, I hope that's useful, and I hope that when the publications come out, everyone listening will help us um, roll it out into the community so people will have the awareness about this issue because it is a sort of sleepy, arcane area. That is, as you know, we hear so much more about today. It's it's just so vital. Um, so. With that, I will uh, turn it over to the founder uh, of the Glushko Samuelson. So, thank you all very much for coming, and and thanks to again to, to all of you who who are or will be following this very unique event on the web today. The the topic is intersectional, as those of you who were here last night for the 10th annual IP Gender Workshop, which was also around this topic, know we're, we're all about intersectionality here at uh, the Program on Information, Justice, and Intellectual Property at the Washington College of Law. And this intersection between policy relating to traditional or indigenous communities and intellectual property is actually an older issue than one might think. People have been writing at a 
theoretical level for at least 60 years about the proposition that globally and from country to country, intellectual property law sort of systematically under-recognizes the cultural productions associated with traditional and indigenous communities while providing, on the other hand, higher and higher levels of protection for the characteristic cultural productions of the most developed states and communities of the world. So the notion that there is a kind of structural injustice in the IP system is by, by not by any stretch of imagination a new idea. What's new, I think, new to the last 15 or 20 years, perhaps, is, are, are two things. First, that this topic is no longer just a matter of kind of expert speculation, but instead, on the one hand, a matter of significant policy concern on the state level, at state and states, including the United States, and perhaps more significantly still, it is now a topic around which the people and representatives of the indigenous and traditional communities who are most effective by it have begun to organize and speak and be heard. And it's really that, that, core, that coming together of, of of a long overdue recognition at the state level that this is an issue, and at the international level too, uh, that needs to be dealt with, and the, the increasing emphasis on the importance of this issue in the statements of the communities themselves that make this a very, very timely topic. And so we have today four panels which are going to examine different dimensions of this intersection between policy toward Native, federal policy toward Native Americans and indigenous communities around the world and intellectual property. And to describe those panels very briefly, I want to offer you a distinction which I think is useful, although by no means like any other binary distinction, um, without its, its own limitations. And that is the distinction between negative and positive recognition of the cultural rights of traditional communities. By positive protection, we mean the reconsideration, revision, reform of laws to give some Is that me? <laughs> to give some kind of affirmative recognition to the, the old songs, the old stories, the old names, the old ways of doing things, of, of, of making music and, and planting and harvesting the old technologies, it's possible to imagine changes in the state, the national and international level legal systems that will actually take those things, which are for the most part without recognition in contemporary intellectual property law and confer on their custodians those who continue to practice them over generations, some kind of affirmative right, right you can take the court, or right you can use against someone who is, is encroaching on that space at, in much the same way that we can use as trademarks and patents and copyrights for that purpose with respect to the uh, cultural productions of the dominant culture. Those are positive rights, and we've got a couple of panels today that are going to deal primarily with the question of the, uh, the prospects for the development of or the recognition of greater positive rights in this body of knowledges that we're discussing. Uh, 
especially the panel I'm going to chair this afternoon, which is going to be focused on the development of possible international treaties in this area. It's very much a positive rights focused panel, and I think at least some part of the panel that Mike Carroll will be moderating at the end of the day on non-traditional solutions to issues in traditional knowledge and traditional cultural expressions will have the same uh, framing. But we should also think about negative rights. We should also think about the ability of, about mechanisms that create a capacity, an ability, a competency in traditional communities to prevent the appropriation and exploitation of their material or material associated with them, whether it's cultural objects or names or brands by others, especially in ways that are inappropriate, tasteless, or demeaning. And this is a very, very big part of the development of thinking about intellectual property and traditional knowledge or traditional cultural expression. Some of the greatest successes that have been achieved so far in the field by, the, by activists on behalf of traditional communities have been in the field of what might be called negative protection. Protection that's designed to stop the appropriation by others of traditional material as private intellectual property. And so I think some of the panels this morning will deal at least in part with what might be called this dimension of negative uh, intellectual property protection. Again, I would suggest that this is a, a perfect division of the world into, into two hemispheres because there are no such divisions, but it may be a useful one as we go through the day. And again, we're very grateful to all of you for, for coming and for tuning in. And we're also very grateful, I should say, to the administration of Washington College of Law, to Dean Claudio Grossman, for having allowed us over the last decade or so to construct an academic program around intellectual property, which really has a somewhat different focus, a somewhat different emphasis from the programs that exist at many other institutions, which are wonderful programs in their own right, but which perhaps don't focus quite as much as we have been allowed to do and have enjoyed so much doing on issues that relate intellectual property issues specifically to issues of social justice. And I think with that, I'm going to to stop and to turn it over to Vicki because we have a lot to hear about um, a very important set of contemporary issues on this panel. So again, thank you very much. Peter, um, and that's a great introduction to our panel, which is about um, misappropriation of culture. with fantastic panelists, and just to give you a little introduction to what Steve, do you want to hit show you this thing? Bhavanath Way, Liz Nikaz, Mayan Gendot, and Bawatin Yes. 
That is a piece that was put out by the National Congress of American Indians. And um, it's pretty, pretty powerful, and I thought it was a nice introduction to, to our panel today, because as Peter said, this panel is going to focus on um, defensive activities and, defend, and policies and laws that, that, that should help, should help um, Native communities in that regard. Is that they have a substantial interest in protecting, accessing, and controlling their culture, their story out there in the world their personhood, their peoplehood, as Sonia Patel of Bit Boredom and Kristen Carpenter call it. Um, so this panel, I have three wonderful, incredible people I am so honored and privileged to introduce, and they are all Native, Native Americans. So, so we are going to hear from, hear from fantastic scholars and activists. And is it on? Hello? Yes, it's on. Sorry. Thank you. Um, and 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 also people um, in the government. So so, let me start with on my far right is Suzanne Shon Harjo, Suzanne Cheyenne Haldogi Muskogee. She's a writer, curator, and Native political activist. And as most of us know, she's contributed to the protection of sacred land and the repatriation of cultural objects. Suzanne's been a key figure in many important legal and legislative battles concerning indigenous rights over the past three decades, including the passage of the 1990 Native American Graves Protection and Repatriation Act, the 1989 National Museum of American Indian Act, and the 78 American Indian Religious Freedom Act. She's a founding trustee of the museum and a chief architect of many of its policies and is active in its initiatives, including a new exhibit we'll hear about today. Suzanne has been honored with numerous awards and fellowships from Dartmouth, from Stanford. She's visited there. Um, she is, is, uh, has been a moderator at numerous programs at the museum, worked on films. And she's past executive director of the National Congress of American Indians and the current president and executive director of the Morning Star Institute, a native rights advocacy organization. Next to Suzanne, we're happy to have Eric Bruce Wilson, who's the International Affairs Coordinator of Indian Affairs at the U.S. Department of the Interior. Um, Eric is a member of the Nez Perce Tribe of Idaho. For more than 36 years, he's been serving in Indian Affairs in Washington. He was born on the Fort Peck Reservation in Poplar, Montana, and spent his early years in Indian country, including Washington State, South Dakota, Nevada, and California. He's married and has three children. And he's currently in the office of the Assistant Secretary, Indian Affairs, where he coordinates the International Affairs for the Bureau of Indian Affairs and the Bureau of Indian Education. He's a leader of the Interagency Working Group on Indigenous Issues that's charged with broadening knowledge on international human rights among tribal, state, and local officials, as well as non-governmental organizations. His mission is to assure that the U.S. foreign policy on indigenous issues is consistent with domestic federal Indian law and policy, and he coordinates with the interior policy advisors and attorneys from the department's office of the solicitor. And next to me is Gabrielle Tayak from the National Museum of American Indian. Um, Dr. Tayak is a member of the Piscataway Indian Nation. She earned her PhD and MA from Harvard and her BS um, in Indian, American Indian Studies and Social Work from Cornell. And her scholarly research focuses on American Indian identities, religious traditions, social movements, and, main, and, and maintaining a regional special, specialization in the Chesapeake Bay. Um, Gabrielle is a historian at the National Museum of American Indian. She's curated numerous ex exhibitions on Native history and contemporary experience. And we're going to hear about a new one today. Get a sneak 
preview. And she's a respected writer and speaker, and she most recently edited Indivisible, African Native American Lives, and she earned her doctorate um, in sociology from Harvard. So thank you all for, for being here today. Um, and I think the best place to start um, is, 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 with, is with Gabby and hear about what the National Museum of American Indian is doing in terms of having the federal policy bully pulpit um, to, to change cultural consciousness about these issues. Thanks, Gabby. Thank you. Morning. Let me get uh, the remote. I need to cue up my talk. Okay. So good morning, and thank you so much for for having me. It is quite an honor to be on a panel with such distinguished colleagues and friends, and also to think about the idea from our from the museum perspective and from the cultural and social perspective that symbols frame the mind. And so, for Native peoples who make up a very small percentage of the population, but such a huge part of the imaginary consciousness in the United States and around the world, it's very key for us to be able to enter in and meet people where they are and start to explore those moments where um, the consciousness about Native people is generally rooted in, in myth, um, tremendous misinformation. The idea that most of our K through 12 education barely scratches the surface of U.S. history as it relates to Native peoples. And that's why we have um, such an idea where when you have a racist mascot, it's not just like it would hit another group where there is more material, more people, more interaction with the real, with the reality in order to combat or for people to say, oh yeah, I know this person and I know they're not like that. It's that usually the, the meeting is with that symbol. So we decided, um, the National Museum of the American Indian has been open now for 10 years. Um, we're part of Smithsonian, which is a, it's a quasi-federal institution. It's a creative, intellectual, and scientific institution. We do receive half of our money from Congress, but we are independent in many ways from, from the federal policy. At the same time, our location um, is right next to the U.S. Capitol. We have two million visitors a year physically. We have many that come through um, through the web process and through other kinds of interactions. And so Suzanne actually was very, very key in establishing uh, this institution. So we, we do have a civic responsibility. It's not just um, sheerly theoretical. Um, it's something where we do have this idea of civic engagement. So I thought that I would share uh, with you a little um, sneak peek about how we're going in the direction right now for new permanent exhibitions. We started originally, and this is still a, a very, very deep and abiding commitment that we have in order to introduce Native voice, to have Native intellectual um, development and speech and ways of thinking introduced to the public. So there's a space always where, where that is. Um, we also know that 95% of our visitors are non-native. So we have, you know, your, your typical uh, DC tourist group. Um, we also have actually a pretty uh, reasonable um, number of people who are, who look at the museum as a site of reconciliation. It's somewhere where they want to come and know the truth 
and interact with the truth, but they just maybe don't know how. Maybe they know a lot. Some of our visitors are very knowledgeable. But we also have Native people from around the hemisphere. We're a hemispheric institution. We also relate to Native Hawaii. And so there has to be something there for, for Native people as well. Uh, so we decided to go more in the direction of looking at, at it rather than looking from the outside in to the other. We felt that at this juncture, it is extremely critical for us to make a move into reframing um, national consciousness about Native peoples. So that even though they don't have people when they come through don't have every single piece of information, you can have some kind of schema to work from. So I wanted to talk about, um, you know, forget the mascot. So of course we have the no, <laughs> this silence, be blatant about this. Um, Redskins, completely unacceptable. Uh, we had a, we've, we've worked for a number of years educationally and then sponsored a symposium in February which caught the eye. And it wasn't that people hadn't been working on this for decades. Suzanne's been working on it for decades. In the 80s, I was part of protests outside of the stadiums, people throwing drinks in our faces, really freaking out about the fact of like, how could we take this precious symbol from them? Um, it's almost like you're some kind of national traitor. It's like, um, I've actually heard Suzanne say something like you become like the skunk in the room. It's really crummy. Um, so, so the idea that you, you have this symbol, um, redskins, but in fact, you know, on the other hand, we have real figures like the great Jim Thorpe, um, who is considered to be the greatest athlete um, of the 20th century. And he's so great that it's much healthier to be on a Wheaties box than eating Chili's fries at the Redskins game, I would say. Um, we're looking at this, at this, um, okay. So this concept that American Indian history, American Indian experience, is not just a marginal, exotic other. American Indian history and American Indian experience is actually fundamental to American history, fundamental to how we frame who we are as a nation. However, what we choose to remember and what we choose to forget makes us who we are. And that's the statement that we are putting forward for this new exhibit that we're calling Americans uh, that will open in 2017 at the National Museum of the American Indian. It will be a permanent exhibition. We thought that rather than go through the most, perhaps the most important um, historic events, that we would look at engaging with people at the moments where they think about American Indians the most. And we thought that there were four, four stories that seemed to be coming up to the consciousness all of the time. It's Thanksgiving, Pocahontas, Trail of Tears, the Battle of Little Bighorn. And then um, there's another one that is part of American mythology, the gold rush, that there are no Indians in it at all. We think about Yosemite Sam, we think about uh, prospectors, we think about California, here we come, uh, 49ers, but we don't think at all about the hundreds of thousands of native people in California and the genocide that occurred there. So we felt that it was important to move that way. So Thanksgiving, here's the image that many people have in their mind. And in fact, um, Thanksgiving, including Indians, is from a few lines in a letter by Edward Winslow in 1621. So the event actually happened. It actually happened at Plymouth. Massasoit, the great Wampanoag Sachem, was there with 19 others of his people. Um, but the pilgrims were also greeted earlier by Samoset, an Abenaki leader, who was able to say to them when they arrived, welcome Englishmen. He spoke English and had been involved with traders for many years. He also had um, brought with him a few days later Squanto, whose name was Tisquantum, who was a Patuxet, also the Wampanoag Confederacy, who had been 
taken into slavery um, by English ships, had spent many years in Europe, and came back. So he was very fluent in English for that purpose. So the idea of you know, this happy meeting, yes, there was a dinner. It took place for three days. There were Native peoples there. But there's so much more to it. And we actually enact and ingest this um, feast. It's it, What we found out um, in doing more research is that it was a pretty good moment. It's not like, oh, Thanksgiving was so terrible and, and feel horrible about it. Um, but that there's so much more behind it and so much more that comes from it. Harvard College was founded as an institution for the education of Indians and English. There were several Native graduates. It's a site where Native people engaged with the translation and printing press of the first Bible printed in the Anglo world called A Biblum God, which is printed in the Massachusetts language. The Indian College was disassembled. Um, the brick by brick uh, was used to construct the institution for the education solely of whites for centuries. However, it's founded in the idea of educating Native and English people. Um, we see a degradation of the original moment of Thanksgiving into King Philip's war. Uh, King Philip Metacom was a son of Massasoit. Um, the people had been so intensely dispossessed. Um, all of the agreements had been broken. People were being coerced off of their lands. And so it started basically a world war in New England. Um, this is where the moment of history changes. You have to ask from that moment of Thanksgiving, which we remember, we don't remember King Philip's War. We don't remember why there are such few communities left on the land in New England, which was entirely inhabited by Native peoples. And there are surviving peoples today, actually, Mashpee, Aquina, Mashpee just recently got federal recognition, so it makes it even more incredible that these people um, have survived and made it and have redirected um, education about Thanksgiving, who they are, and that they're more than Thanksgiving, of course, that they're looking at ways of, of development. This man here, sorry, this man here on the, the right is Ninigret. Um, you can see him clothed in the ideas of wealth and power from a Native perspective in wampum, the shell that's traded uh, from the shore inward. Okay, so Pocahontas, the most famous teenager in American history on this side. We know her um, variously in, in many ways. Um, when we've been talking about her, we can say she can almost be anybody you want her to be. She can be a demure maiden. She can be a, um, a traitor, like La Malinche figure. Um, she can be a victim, but in fact, um, her real life, as depicted on this side, this engraving by Simon Vantapass, is the only image that we have of her from life. So how different is that from the image that we have in her mind, in our minds? This image on the other side, the engraving, where she's in England in um, the late, around 1620, is inscribed in the Book of Kings. She is shown as a self-determined diplomat. She was there with a retinue from her father, the Powhatan, to start to negotiate their stage and their place as sovereign peoples vis-a-vis -vis the King of England, not as subordinate, but as another foreign power. And there were gifts exchanged. So who she actually is in reality is so obscured by this idea of, of the Indian princess and the point that even if she's shown as kind of a spunky girl in a moment in time in the movie, um, a romantic kind of figure, in fact, um, she is a representative of an entire native system of government at the time. Um, and also the person who is part of the introduction of tobacco economy into Virginia. We know also often about the Trail of Tears, and we were thinking about this one quite a bit, um, because 
in reality, it's not just a tragic moment of time, a terrible thing that happened for a moment. The Trail of Tears um, is part of a policy of Indian removal, which affected the entire United States. There were people removed all the way from upper New York into from California, from the Southwest. It was the composition of Oklahoma. And there's something even more to that, something that, that we found out um, in the course of our research was wondering, well, what, what was removal really about? Why is the Southeast, which was the home to native nations, sometimes known as five civilized tribes, uh, Creek, Chickasaw, Cherokee, Seminole, and Choctaw, thank you. <laughs> um, what, what, is, what was that really about? And in conversation with um, our colleagues at the new National Museum of African American History and Culture, we started to uncover what was really going on with it. And for those of us who have known about Indian removal, we've studied it, we've looked at it, we know that it was about the land. Of course, it's always about the land. But here's the thing. It's really about King Cotton and the spike of slavery. The fact that uh, slavery was mostly in the Vir Virginia, kind of Chesapeake, very coastal areas, that there's an expansion in something that would be called the Second Middle Passage. So this image on this side is a group of enslaved African-American peoples in Georgia, uh, people who had ended up being sold down the river into these areas. So the notion that Indian removal is, is not, it is the Trail of Tears, but it's something more. Our knowledge of, of Cherokee, the idea of this kind of connection to Cherokee, people always talk about having Cherokee ancestry in their family. It may or may not be true. We don't know. Um, but the fact is, is that it's, it's really part of the notion that American wealth and power is based on ethnic cleansing and slavery. And that's a, that's a statement that will be interesting to see when we put it out there, how, how, it's, how it's put forward. Um, but it shows that, again, Native history, and when you really just take the moment and you expand it and you pull it back, that you take it from the mascot or this, this one image that people maybe have, even if it's a, if it's a moment of, of, of coming to terms with shame and tragedy, that it's not just shame and tragedy. It's policy. It's policy. And there are about 100 Native nations in almost every region of the entire United States that are affected by Indian removal. It changed the shape of the country. We also have the idea of the Battle of Little Bighorn, um, victorious moment. On this side, we have Custer's Last Stand, um, as depicted by Buffalo Bill's Wild West show. Um, and this is kind of the moment where um, the image of Native people as Plains Indians only starts to come into view. Because we were wondering, like, what's the thing about Thanksgiving, like, where you have these people in full Plains headdresses, and when did that start to happen? Well, it happens because of the Buffalo Bill Wild West show, which went all over Europe and, and the United States. Um, it formed the mind so that it almost, like, it takes that moment and then it backtracks. The Battle of Little Bighorn in 1876 is a point where you had an amazing moment of victory of peoples against the 7th Cavalry. Um, but then it also affixes the wider picture of what happened afterwards and what had been happening beforehand. So that it, it was really a moment where the U.S. had come into uh, Indian removal. We also know what happened pre-U.S. in New England. Um, there had been an entire march across the country coming back, and then we have this moment of, of native assimilation policy, of children being taken away, put into boarding schools. Um, this is one of the before and after pictures. It's very famous. It was a policy for, for many, many years. <laughs> the social, emotional, psychological impacts on our communities are still felt today by people who had been in that system. And so when people play cowboys and Indians, even if it's trying to be the more sensitive notion as we might see Johnny Depp in, in, as Tonto is, is trying to make a different 
kind of stance, um, it again obscures the bigger history. And finally, um, with the California gold rush, here's an advertisement calling for people to come into the wealth of California. This virgin space, which in fact had been taken um, in war with Mexico, and so you have the whole interaction with, with the Mexican world, um, but it had been the most diverse and most populous um, place for Native peoples in the country. By 1849, when the U.S. had, had come into power there and opened it up, there was actually literally policies of genocide and extermination unleashed on the Native population there, to the point where you have... Um, here is Ishii on this side, um, who lived out the rest of his life in a museum. As a matter of fact, it's basically a living museum. But it's symbolic of, of so much more, of tribes that were reduced almost entirely or maybe to four people. Um, and this is one of the biggest stories never know. So it's very important for us to um, come back from looking at at the symbology and start to probe where the history is. And what we're hoping is, is that through, that through that moment, through that point of connection through the mascot and to start peeling it back and then widen and ask people, why do you know what you know and what is it that you see? And then start to change the frame of what they see. That maybe they'll be more open so that when much more significant events, current events happen, that they're prepared emotionally, psychologically, socially to engage. Thank you. Thank you. A little backstory, perhaps? We have a commercial for an exhibit that I'm just curating all the trees. Great nations in their own words. And <clears throat> that will open on uh, September 21st of this year at the National Museum of the American Museum. And it's been about 10 years in the making. And we invite everyone to come um, to the opening or anytime after the opening. And, uh, really looking forward to the actual production of the publication and, um, uh, and of course the exhibit itself and all the uh, associated program. So it will be very exciting. Uh, the, the National Museum of the American Indian is starting to get into uh, full content uh, exhibiting that's very exciting, what's happening there. Um, so at the same time that we're building the National Museum, then building and building the National Museum of the American Indian, which was 20 years in the making, we, uh, our first coalition meeting was in 1967, mm -hmm. and uh, that's where we picked it up, uh, as well as came up with the ideas for repatriation law and for religious freedom law and policy. So, um, and, and, and those things came about with the, the Religious Freedom Act. Uh, we managed to get pretty quickly, and that was in 1978. Uh, but it took until 1989 and 90 laws, and, and also uh, and that kind of broke loose a lot of the um, resistance that we had met uh, up until that point to the cultural rights uh, agenda, and we started getting the National uh, Native Languages Act, various acts, and amendments to the American um, Arts and Crafts Act, and 
which is administered out of the interior. So while we were doing all of these things to kind of correct history or address history or insert ourselves into various policies and, and federal processes and, um, <clears throat> and to building institutions, we had to deal with the things that, that um, were addressed earlier uh, in terms of uh, protection and, and, uh, and the, the downside of that, the negative side of that. And I look at it as, as um, kind of two categories of offenses. And one is name calling and the other is like the thievery. Uh, so, it, you know, in the category of name calling, of course, the, the Washington football team, all of these uh, other organizations, uh, football franchises that uh, have, that overlay, overlay us with uh, false identities. And one thing that we're really happy about in the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples is the recognition uh, that Native peoples, the traditional Indigenous peoples the world over, have the self-determining right uh, to create and project our own identities. Uh, so, and that's a very important thing uh, to us. And, and that so what these uh, football franchises are doing is really violating that uh, self-determination uh, aspect of our, uh, of our rights. We also think it's a, a human rights violation, but that's, that's another matter. So from 88 to 92, I and a, a handful of other Native people had been meeting with the uh, Interior Department for the Arts and Crafts Act, uh, the Federal Trade Commission, which has a similar statute that they can prosecute cases. Uh, they can bring cases themselves uh, under their own statute. And um, the U.S. Patent and Trademark Office and the Library of Congress, and we had a verbal agreement that they would accept the, they would recognize the right of Native American nations to declare what our cultural problems and that they would do what they could in their and they would do can you uh, hear me better okay they would do what they could do within their framework each of those agencies to uh, carry out that recognition so, Nation X, Tribe X would present their Declaration of Cultural Property Rights, which would include things like our name is. Now, that might be a shared right with other Native nations, but each one would be presenting on their own behalf, declaring on their own behalf. And what they would be declaring is uh, their, their ownership of territory, of names, of symbols, uh, the Zia sun sign, is, has been appropriated by the uh, state of New Mexico, and it's their symbol, they, the symbol they use 
on their flag and on everything else is from the Zia Pueblo. And it's only in recent years that they have begun to recognize that fact and to acknowledge it publicly uh, and to take private steps to work out some sort of accommodation with the Zia Pueblo for the continuing use of that uh, symbol. So this declaration would kind of um, address those matters in the first instance. So if, if someone came through with a request for a patent on uh, a name that either belittled us or that took our name and used it for their purposes, they would know they could rely on this document uh, as, as the Apache uh, Declaration of Cultural Property, right there it says no one should use the name Apache, or Cherokee, or Cheyenne, and so forth. Now, the Cheyennes may say no one can use our name. And what they mean is we don't want it used for the bar and grill or for tacky kinds of enterprises. But if we're talking about a children's hospital, that's a whole other matter. We might consider that. But it's up to us. It's not up to anyone else. It should not be. And it's not just out there in the open for people to appropriate at will. So these are the, the areas that we were moving in and at the same time trying to get everyone to recognize that as we're protecting uh, with, with all the, the ways that each agency can protect, uh, we need to stop the offense of name calling, which is a more general matter. So, with the Washington football team, for example, that's a general uh, slap in the face and a general uh, slur toward all of us. It. It's not just against the Cheyennes or against the Muskogees or against the Apaches. Or, it, it's everyone. It, as you saw in that good video that uh, NCAI put out earlier this year. So then along came Stephen Baird with um, his law journal and uh, interviewing me and saying he had really two questions. Why had I rejected the idea of the Patent and Trademark Office as a forum uh, to address these issues against the Washington team and why had I rejected the uh, the use of Section 2 of the Lanham Act uh, as the cause of action. And I said, I have no idea what you're talking about. <laughs> so he explained it to me, and by the time he left, I had retained him as an attorney and went to our board and our board agreed to be a sponsoring organization and then I selected my who would be my co-plaintiffs over the um, long period we didn't know how long uh, it, and as, as Vicki described uh, we ultimately were were uh, 
But our case uh, ultimately ended uh, through the loophole of latches, which had been raised uh, in, we filed our lawsuit in 1992 in September, and it was raised in December by the opposing side. Uh, They raised 13 equitable defenses, and one of them was latches. And what the, and the Patent and Trademark Office uh, took until March of the following year and it then came back with a decision that none of the equitable defenses would apply and that um, I, because there was an overriding, undergirding, overarching public policy issue at stake, which was what the federal government should sanction. So, in other words, the owners of the Washington franchise can call their team any racist name they want, but the issue before the court is should the federal government sanction it with its own imprimatur by rewarding the exclusive privilege of making money off that racist name. So that's been the lawsuit, and that's what we won in 1999 uh, when the Patent and Trademark Board's uh, TTAB Trademark Trial and Appeal Board came back with a unanimous decision uh, in 145-page decision. So we spent the next 10 years defending that decision in the federal courts and ultimately lost when the uh, Supreme Court declined to review the issue of latches. But we we never lost on the merits. So uh, we won on the merits. We just lost through latches, uh, which we thought we had already dealt with in 1992 and 1993. So when I saw that that was how it was going, I organized the the lawsuit of young people, young Native people, uh, in 2005 and 2006, and that's the uh, Black Horse case that's now pending before the TTAB. And uh, they couldn't do anything until our case ended, so they didn't really start up until 2009 and 10, and then they just had the hearing for the TTAB judges uh, earlier this year. And we hope that the ruling will go in their direction uh, the, the same way that it went in ours in 1999. So we shall see, and we shall see shortly. Uh, in, in our case, the, it was just under a year from the hearing until the decision rendering uh, time, and so that's what we're looking at uh, for this decision, but then no one knows. We don't know. No one knows. So um, that's where we're at with the, the lawsuit. And then we also have a, a follow-on lawsuits, uh, which are which regard the new matters, and there are all these requests that have stacked up over the uh, litigating period for new registrations, and so we have opposed those through letters of protest, and those letters have been accepted within the Patent and Trademark Office, but those are being held in abeyance pending the outcome of the Black Horse case. So um, we have one lawsuit 
that is being decided right now and then others that are in holding patterns over O'Hare um, <laughs> and, uh, until that that's decided. So um, uh, it, what, what, once we filed the lawsuit in the Pat, U.S. Patent and Trademark Board, it, what happened um, with our other talks about the protection end and what and trying to get a written agreement to uh, confirm our verbal agreement with all the federal agencies uh, was that everything was stopped by our lawsuit in the other area. And um, people just kind of pulled back and said, oh, you know, there's a lawsuit. This is in litigation now. Well, this was not in litigation. We were talking about protection end over there, and the lawsuit was about the offense. Uh, So uh, that was too subtle, apparently. And... Our, our talks were halted by all the federal agencies. So at some point, we need to get back to that and um, reconvene. And I'm hoping that, that Interior and, and, and MAI would be in a good position to kind of help that move along and, and, and get back uh, going so we can... Um, uh, start having a uh, just start down the road toward a written agreement uh, that the agencies will do what they can within their own framework to recognize and and apply the declaration tribal declarations of cultural property rights. Great. Thank you. Thank you, Suzanne. That, then that's a fantastic um, segue into to Eric. Um, Eric Wilson from from Interior, because we've talked about reframing the national consciousness and the the early cultural agenda, and and we talked yesterday a little bit about reinventing our laws and policy and reframing them in this area, and and what are the what are what's going on in the agency um, as this is spinning around around you? Okay, well, uh, thank you, Victoria. Thank you for your preceding remarks. Um, I guess the, the punctuation is in what uh, exists today and, and what we need to continue to emphasize. Uh, self-determination is the policy of the, the United States. Tribes are self-governing, all 50, 566. Tribes regulate their members. Uh, tribes have the authority to pass laws and to protect their cultural heritage. Intellectual property, IP as we're saying it here today, is is this a subset of cultural heritage. Yes, tribes do know how to manage cultural heritage. How does the intangible make a difference? It's part of identity. The indigenous worldview we hear in our various fora, international and domestically. That's part of the connection of the past to the present to the future. Now, as Geb has pointed out, um, there there have been certain things that have happened in this country. Culture busting and the taking of identity is an historical fact for the U.S. to reckon with. Uh, Even Special Rapporteur James Anaya pointed out uh, in his 2012 report uh, on the condition of uh, indigenous human rights in the United States that the the U.S. needs to engage in long-term reconciliation. The protection of cultural heritage is a part of this for there to be healing. Now, 
intellectual property in that narrow institution can acknowledge tribal identity and the tribal values, acknowledge indigenous culture. And in theory, a little bit with the term uh, recognize. Um, there's uh, a, a certain, certain slight difference in, in terminology here, and, and, and to, to say that, that, that we, uh, we acknowledge is to say that it's always been there. Uh, that's, that's the way sovereignty is, is dealt with in, in this country. We acknowledge that, that you exist as a sovereign, not grant sovereignty as a result of a recognition. Um, it, yes, um, intellectual property is, is an adjunct to development, but first um, it can be a tool for protection and conservation of cultural heritage. Tools for furthering, empower, uh, further empowering uh, tribal self-determination. The capacity for social and economic advancement. Tribal cultures are not static. I said that yesterday. Uh, Professor Conway's idea that uh, the indigenous worldview fuse with modern processes, modern ideas, um, is, is a fine idea. Tribes are having internal consultations about values and about customary laws and about how that fits in with uh, the, the debate that is taking place now, as uh, Peter pointed out. And um, the department of the interior acknowledges that tribes have the right to collective control over their culture, like cultural heritage, cultural identity, in tangible and intangible forms. And, uh, I'm, I'm happy to, to be here uh, today. Uh, sitting in, in, in place of Assistant Secretary Kevin Washburn, who found all of the topics on the, the, uh, the program compelling, uh, and um, he was disappointed that he was unable to, to, to be here himself today. Um, but I look forward to uh, further panels and, and Hopefully, have time for questions. That's great. No, thank you, Eric, and, and thank you for representing him today. Absolutely, I, I can imagine we have we have some some questions out there for this audience, and I want to um, I have some, but I want to re re give the audience a chance to um, to come forward. It looks like we have microphones here and there, um, so come on up, come on down. <laughs> uh oh, here we go. And we'll start with our own distinguished Christine Haight Farley. Hello, thank you for that wonderful panel. I really appreciated it. Um, Suzanne, I have a question for you going back to that conversation that you had with the USPTO that I hope will continue. And the question is, again, it's kind of a, a Stephen Baird question, um, and that is, what in the current act could be used better? So in addition to 2A, which prohibits the registration of disparaging marks, 2B prohibits the registration of state insignia. And it can be, uh, I think that the idea of insignia is meant to be broadly interpreted, and it is the insignia of foreign nations. Uh, it's a advantageous section to use because, of course, there is another section which prohibits the registration of any symbols or words that would be likely to cause uh, to, to falsely suggest a connection with organizations, groups, peoples, etc. The problem with that is that, um, and there have been some cases, in fact, there's a case involving the word Mohawk, um, but for some native symbols that may not be generally known to the population, um, under that other section, in order to falsely suggest a connection, the public would have to understand the origin of the symbol. So um, Section 2B, which prohibits the registration of state insignia, no knowledge need 
you know, there, there doesn't need to be any knowledge amongst the general population. It would simply be a question of whether the USPTO can have a resource in which they find that sun symbol or, this is not working very well, yeah. the sun symbol or whatever symbol or word is at issue. So was that, was that discussed at all, whether that, that section could be utilized? It was not, um, although that may have been an internal discussion. Uh, we did not raise that, uh -huh. but that, that's really useful to know. Mm -hmm. uh, I think I hadn't gotten as far down as B. <laughs> Thank, <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> but of course, the term the term that you were trying to knock off would not would not come under B, right? The term that they were trying to knock off wouldn't come is not an insignia. The, the, the Washington Park, right? Right, right. So, not, yeah. But it's right. a great, it's a great vehicle for tribe, tribes to on their own. Yeah. Exactly. And I don't. Is there much? Is there much case law under that? Christine, that, that? I, I don't think so. Um, and, so. And if it could be interpreted broadly as protection of identity. Uh, What's nice about that section is the uh, the reason for that prohibition, and this is this is a, a, a statutory provision which is in all you know countries' trademarks acts and and is in uh, international treaties. Is the idea of it is to allow someone to commercially appropriate a national symbol is you know it does not show respect and 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 the dignity that these national symbols deserve. So there's no you know, what does the public think? Are they confused? Do they think it's bad? It's just kind of a per se prohibition for the purpose of dignity. Yeah, it's That's really great. good to know. Thank you very much. That's great. Hopefully my students' booklet will, will make all this, will bring all this to light. Yes. Um, I'm going to be like Lane, Elaine. I have to let the next Lane in. So, so Danielle, over, over on this. Thanks for those presentations. So Gabby, Eric, and Suzanne. Could you actually give me an indication about what the indigenous peoples who you interacted with and that you belong to, what are their thoughts about operating within their own governance structure, say outside of what USPTO, TTAB, that our courts would be saying? What about the governance structures that you erect? similar to those in the Declaration for the Rights of Indigenous Peoples? Yeah, a short answer. Uh, it goes by different terms, but it's part of um, uh, tribal government legal infrastructure. We've talked about uh, intellectual property and cultural heritage uh, in, in terms of economic development. Um, and uh, in, 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 in tribes are looking to codify customary law it's so difficult to do um, get, getting uh, consensus uh, among a, a tribal membership first with the elders and, and then with the uh, uh, membership at large. But there are uh, our tribes that are, are, are working in that direction. Um, and, and first, you know, for self-protection, uh, self-help, but also um, because we have a government-to-government -government political relationship with tribal governments, that counts for something in the U.S. government structure, in our national structure. And, uh, and, and so, therefore, also it, uh, it's important on the international uh, stage. And hopefully we'll get it right so that the rest of the world uh, can uh, run in the same fashion. One thing we did in the repatriation laws, uh, especially in NAGPRA, the Native American Graves Protection and Repatriation Act, um, was to change the lexicon. It, we didn't like the terminology that was being used and uh, thought it was either inaccurate or uh, just too loose for us, or 
had been used against us. Uh, so we insisted on human remains rather than bones and specimens and all of the terms that had been used. Um, and insisted on funerary objects rather than grave goods. And um, so we, we did that. We, we changed the lexicon. And one term that, that we used was cultural patrimony. And that was a way of getting away from intellectual property. Um, we're talking about real items and real rights that relate to us. So cultural property rather than intellectual property. I, and that's the direction I think most of us would, would rather go when we're talking about the intersection of our laws and, and the federal laws and policies. I just wanted to um, bring up an, an example that uh, I'm working on another exhibit about nations of New York. and seeing some of the, the self-determination policies, the economic development um, take hold, for example, in a place like Akwesasne, St. Regis Mohawk, where um, there were people um, being elected and serving in chief's positions now who are coming out of the generation of reclamation. So these were um, people who had been raised in the Yakusovsky Freedom School, which was a grassroots effort, had relearned the language and skipped a, a generation, um, raised within the longhouse tradition, had worked in midwifery and women's health. That's another chief, Beverly Cook, who's just been elected. It was pretty mind-blowing because I had been there about 20 years before and seen some of these people when they were like either kids or teenagers, and then they're sitting on the council and chief's positions, and their parents had been kind of radical, you know, and, and considered radical, you know, sovereignists, and, and they were, you know, they're really melding the Mohawk worldview and ethic now in the context of a tribal council partnering with the agencies, but doing it not just legally and um, politically on their own terms, but from a certain standpoint. And I saw that in, in I've been seeing it in numerous places. So it's taken, um, it's taken a generation, but to start to see the turnover is really exciting. So, you know, when you, when you really start to see that, that point and taking the intellectual, um, it's intellectual, cultural sovereignty, moving it into the political sphere. Really good stuff. Thank you. I, I wanted to, to make a comment about something that I hope we can turn back to in the, in the course of the day today, and then also ask a very specific and somewhat unrelated question. And the comment goes to something that Suzanne said a moment ago about the concept of cultural property and the, 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 the appeal of that framing as distinct from the framing in terms of intellectual property. And it, it, the comment is that although I pretty much understand and appreciate that distinction and the appeal of cultural property, there is a, an issue that I see of vocabulary, and that is that uh, in in many contexts, in, in particular in the international context, cultural property is typically used to refer to physical things, to objects and, and, and specific manifestations of, of abstractions in physical space. Um, anything from a, a, a Painting, you know, an old master painting from Europe might be considered a matter of European cultural property, so that it, there would be regulations against it being sold away to the United States. Or, again, Agra, a very good example in which the, the accomplishment, I think, of that single piece of legislation is to 
is to define for purposes of federal legislation funerary goods and and and, and human remains as aspects of physical cultural property. The difficulty, I think, is that so many of the topics about which we are now interested are not things that have direct physical manifestations. That so many of the sources, so many of the, our concerns about misappropriation, so many of our dignitary concerns relate to items, manifestations, expressions, which are really abstract rather than physical. Uh, and therefore do fall according to the traditional distinctions made in the vocabulary of the field on the intellectual rather than the cultural property side. And I think that's fascinating, important, and, and, and worth talking about as we go through the day. Here's my specific question, which is, you have been talking in a fascinating way on this panel in all, through all sorts of different lenses about the, the importance of doing work on these issues very much from the bottom up, through the structures that exist, through the, the, the knowledges that are, are preserved and maintained within the Indian nations. But there's also a kind of a top-down approach, which we've attempted from time to time. And one example I think of that, although I'd be interested if you would, if you would argue with my characterization, is the Indian Arts and Crafts Act of 1990, which, which establishes a federal prohibition against the misleading use of the term Indian or the, a specific tribal name with respect to goods that aren't Indian or aren't the goods of that tribe. And uh, although I'm sure that, that Native Americans advocated for or participated in the advocacy for that legislation, the, the framework that, that resulted is really not one that relies very much, I think, on, on the, the on customary knowledge or on the, the, the views of the community. And I'm very curious what you think about how that is working. What you think about the effectiveness of both the approach and that specific legislation that's embodied in the Indian Arts and Crafts Act. So. Well, the Indian Arts and Crafts Act, uh, of course, was uh, enacted in the 1930s by a coalition of Native people and non-Native artists, uh, including uh, D.H. Lawrence and Georgia O'Keeffe. And, uh, and the coalition was sort of engineered by, by John Collier, who was a poet and a lawyer and who became the Commissioner for Indian Affairs under the Roosevelt Indian New Deal. And um, so and the first iteration of the act was uh, uh, called the Pseudo-Indian Act, and it just made it, uh, made it a crime to impersonate an Indian. Uh, so that was the first thing. And then, then it, it went it doesn't go to tribal material. It goes to the core of, of tribal rights, which is the right to define your own citizenry. So the issue in the Indian Arts and Crafts Act is whether or not the native artist is truly a citizen of the nation they claim. Uh, does that nation claim them? So through citizenry or membership. And um, so that's the issue, not what kind of work they do, or is it good or bad, or is it painting or pottery, or uh, that doesn't matter. The only thing that matters is, uh, 
are they are they a citizen of their native nation? And that's that's the extent of that law. Is uh, it goes to the individual native person, and the determinations of who is a native are, are exclusively tribal. It, it's not up to the BIA. It's not up to uh, NMAI. It's not up to anyone else. Uh, it's not what I think. It's what the native nation itself thinks. So. That's the Indian Arts and Crafts Act, and what we did in the uh, with the 1990 amendments uh, was to really stiffen the penalties and updated them from the 30s uh, because they needed a lot of updating and and made it more of a crime, uh, more. Putting more teeth into uh, into the act, and so not only was it uh, is it now a crime for the individual to impersonate a native person uh, in the selling of native artwork, but any promoter is also liable. So the National Museum of the American Indian would be liable. Uh, for promotion of false promotion of, of a non-native person as a native person, uh, or any gallery, so heavy fines could be imposed and penalties against any you know, an agency or uh, or a business for promoting this individual. Uh, so you can imagine there were a lot of howls from people and galleries and agencies uh, who had been promoting for a while the fake Indians. They they simply were not Indian. Uh, one one young man from one of the Sioux reservations really liked the work of this one particular artist who was supposed to be from his community, from his nation. And he went door to door trying to find out who the relatives were so he could be introduced through the family. And what he proved was this guy wasn't part of them. Uh, But he did it out of admiration for his work and, and as a fan trying to find him uh, through the families, and it was really a, uh, an honorable uh, mission that he was on. And, but, but he proved the obverse, that the guy was not who he claimed he was. And uh, ultimately, it was found that he was a white man from Texas rather than a Lakota from South Dakota. So. Uh, that's the kind of thing that, that has been happening and uh, that's made illegal under the Indian Arts and Crafts Act. So, and, and there's been another amendment which gave the FBI broader jurisdiction to investigate and prosecute. Uh, and that that's a very recent amendment. Uh, I don't know if Eric wants to comment further about how it's working. I think it's working just fine given uh, uh, given what, what uh, uh, this update with the FBI jurisdiction. I think that was needed. Uh, but I do think it, it, and this is the position of the National Congress of American, American Indians, that the act itself needs to be broadened uh, to academia, uh, to uh, to writers, to curators, to to uh, professors, uh, just going back to the original act itself, the pseudo Indian law. So that's that's one thing that uh, uh, 
Uh, you know, you can watch this space. <laughs> Eric, you want to talk? Uh, just a quick word, yes. Uh, Director Meredith Stanton's uh, work is, is appreciated uh, uh, in the Department of Interior and in Indian Country and, and uh, U.S. reporting uh, in, uh, in our treaty obligations in the United Nations has, has acknowledged the work of the Indian Arts and Crafts Act uh, um, as, as being uh, a, a positive way that. Um, or, as Peter may say, a negative way of stopping the abuse of, um, of um, some aspect of, of culture. Um, it, it, I mean, it, does, it does one thing. It points out, this is fake. This is not. This is not. Um, um, we are struggling to, um, to still continue to emphasize what it is in things, the, the whole uh, um, difficulties with um, sacred objects being sold in uh, Paris auctions uh, during 2013, it, it goes to the heart of the question about what is this thing, and it's not, it's not press, it is um, an embodiment of, uh, of, uh, of, of culture. Uh, of, of individual tribes um, of a spiritual nature, um, and so to, to confuse um, uh, sacred objects with a, a discussion of, uh, of, of uh, arts and crafts and the ability, the commoditization is, is a, a problem that we, we need to work, work through. And, and perhaps the, the, the answer is more work on, on NECRA. Well, I was going to say, too, uh, in response to Peter's commentary that um, it would be difficult to tell a lot of people in Indian country, including myself, that some of our spiritual living beings are not covered under cultural property uh, or or not considered by American society as material. I mean, that's... Uh, so we have a broader... Uh, uh, a broader base for cultural property. Then that's simply the, the the things you can touch and feel. Okay, I think we should. I, this panel can go on forever. I can stay here forever, but I think I need to give my colleague George Contreras some time to have his panel on genetic resources. So at maybe eleven thirty, and take a little break and come back to start that panel. Is that sound right? Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you all to our panelists.